What I'd like to talk to you today about is new developments in CT for failure analysis. And the emphasis was on PCBAs, but I'm also going to show you a lot of other stuff because CT scanning began in worlds other than electronics and it has applications in worlds other than electronics. Uh, the common thread is three-dimensional x-ray technology. And I'm going to show you a lot of examples of work that our company has done in the last year or so, and also some examples that colleagues have shared with me over that same time period to give you some idea of the depth and breadth of capabilities that computed tomography has. This is what a CT scanning lab looks like. This happens to be ours in Fremont, California. Um, this is what's called a vault system. And that simply means it's a system that sits inside a lead shielded room. Why? Because that's a 225 kV x-ray source. And it's sitting on 14,000 pounds of granite for stability. And it has a 16 inch by 16 inch 2048 pixel digital detector, Perkin Elmer detector, and a very large chuck right in the middle, which holds the object of interest when it's being CT scanned. Um, this is in contrast to what are called cabinet systems. If you go to Apex or SMTAI, you'll see the various x ray manufacturers there who are selling units that are more or less the size of a large refrigerator. Those are cabinet systems. This is a custom system, and it had to have the room designed around it once the system was installed. And that's because it's used on very large objects, not just printed circuit boards. What I'm going to talk about today, CT scanning is a world of uncertainty. And it's analogous to a stress-strain curve in mechanical engineering, where you plot strain on one axis and stress on the other axis, and you reach diminishing returns as you proceed over time. And the reason this is analogous with CT scanning is because we really have a learning curve. We have a known technology, but the applications are new all the time. And so it's very hard to define a set piece statement of work for, for all applications. There's no one size fits all definition of how you're going to approach each application. We kind of reinvent the wheel every time. And because of that, there's a lot of technique development involved. And this requires educating the customer because they're not used to that. But that's, I'm going to show some examples of what I mean by that as we go along. The other problem with CT scanning in particular, and perhaps x-ray technology in general, is people get mixed up on the terminology. In our own business, we get calls wanting 2D x-ray, 3D x-ray, CT scanning, 2DX, 3DX, 5DX. I even had one customer call me up a year or so ago and ask for 8DX. As if there are eight dimensions. Let's see here. Length, width, height, time, you know. Uh, 5DX is a trade name. That's all it is. It was invented by Hewlett Packard back in the, I think, the early 90s. They inherited, they inherited a uh, patent from a company called Fortpi in San Diego that developed the technology. It was originally called 3DX for three dimensions. They wanted to market it to the wider world. They wanted to sell it in Asia. So their first thought, new and improved version, we're going to call it 4DX. Well, for those of you who've done business in Asia, you know four is not a very lucky number. <laughs> so the bright MBA minds at Hewlett Packard Agilent said, let's make it 5DX. We'll skip over four. And that's how the that's the etymology of, of, of 5DX. But I still get calls several times a year from people thinking that means dimensions. It doesn't. 
Likewise, 2D versus 3D x-ray. Somebody will call me up and say, uh, I've done 2D x-ray on this board, I've got a bad VGA, I need 3D. What do you mean by that? Well, I want to see it at an oblique angle. Well, that's 2D x-ray. No, it's not, it's 3D. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you, that's 2D. What I'm going to show you today is true three-dimensional x-ray. What is x-ray? What is the physics of x-ray? X-ray is simply energy from electrons, cathode rays, that are excited in a tube, a partially evacuated tube. You apply a voltage, a potential difference over two electrodes, cathode and anode. That creates electrons. They're shot perpendicular to the cathode to one end of the tube. And in so doing, they encounter a wall at the end of the tube, or sometimes an interposing metal. And that collision releases energy. And the release, the change in state, is what creates x-rays. And x-rays are then transparent to all sorts of materials, like paper, like plastics like certain metals, depending on the thickness of the metals. What is digital radiography? Digital radiography is simply x-ray. Single shot, planar x-ray. Taking a three-dimensional object and compressing it or collapsing it down to two dimensions. Computed tomography takes that one step further and takes a series of radiographs, usually made as an object is being rotated, and then compiles those radiographs into a three-dimensional model for analysis, evaluation, failure detection, and so forth. A big part of what I do is simply educating customers. I'll have someone call me up saying they want 5DXASI on a board, and after talking to them for a while and asking questions, it'll become apparent all they want to do is take a picture of a couple pins on a BGA. And that's important because there's a significant cost difference. If you want AXI, you make a program. And that program is designed to look at every solder joint on the board. However, if, if the problem is really your BGA, and certain pins on the BGA where you suspect you have not open, well, there are different techniques for doing that. Often 2D or oblique 2D is more than adequate, and I have to explain that to them. And usually when I tell them the price of doing that is one-third to 25% of the cost of an AXI program, they're very happy. And I'm happy to take their money, but in the long run, you, you want to clarify the terms, because I think in the long run, by doing that, you've got a happier and more informed customer. Here are a couple of images to illustrate the difference I was just talking about. The top image is a radiographic image, what we call DR, digital radiography. It is a three-dimensional object that's been collapsed to a two-dimensional plane. And in so doing, it's captured everything that emits x-rays. By contrast, in computed tomography, we're taking slices, or what we call projections, of that same image. And in doing that, we limit our field of view to that slice as the x-ray beam goes through the object. What happens then, though, is we rotate the object. And as we rotate it, we take discrete projections or slices of that object, and when we're done, when we've completed a full revolution, we have a series of projections. They can be as few as 60. On certain x-ray systems, they can be as many as 10,000. And then you use software to create a model from that. Why do you do that? Well, you get better <laughs> pictures with CT. You get more clarity. You get more detail. This image is looking beneath the transformer on a board, and two of the pictures are taken using CT scan, and one of the pictures is taken using conventional 2D top-down x-ray. It's the same thing, same board, same transformer, different results. 
Here, you've got a lot of noise, you've got a lot of intervening images, you've got the fab, you've got traces on the fab. It's very confusing, it's very difficult to interpret. You have a lot of ambiguity in that image. Now, a trained eye might be able to spot some things, but chances are you might not find the defect you're looking for. With CT, you can take that same real estate and slice through it, create that projection, and get a very high level of detail, get a very high level of resolution. In computed tomography, there are some basic elements that make any system work. I don't care if it's a DAGE system, I don't care if it's a VJ system, a GE, a Zeiss, whatever. You have to have some sort of an x-ray source. You have to have some sort of a flat panel digital detector that will take the photons and translate them into light, which can then be digitized so that you can analyze it. And you have to have some sort of a manipulator mechanism usually here. Something to rotate the object. This is kind of the basic schematic. All systems are different. Some not only can rotate it, they can raise it and lower it. They can also raise and lower the source, raise and lower the detector, so-called helical CT systems will do that. Some have multiple sources, some have multiple detectors. In medical technology, if any of you have ever had a medical CT scan, you are the object and the scanner and the detector are rotating around you. Here, in industrial CT scanning, which we do, you're rotating the object. And when you're done, you have a series of images to analyze. So you have two, the detector, the man manipulator, then you have some means of data reconstruction. A lot of computing power. You then have some means of visualization, which is usually pretty elaborate software that can take all of those projections and turn them into a three-dimensional whole. How do we do that? Well, in the 2D world, we call it pixels. In the 3D world, where we're dealing with volume, we call them voxels. Voxels is the fundamental unit of measure for CT scan. What you're looking at here is a barrel of, I think, nuclear waste material. And each of those squares that you see is a three-dimensional unit of measure or voxel. It's those that ultimately enable us to compile a decent image. Oh, and by the way, there's a lot of math behind this, as you can see. If you're comfortable with math, there's something called a Radon transform. If any of you have taken calculus in engineering school, uh, you need to be comfortable with double and triple integrals, because what you're doing is you're measuring areas of slices and then rotating them, and because of that, you're creating a volumetric measurement in X, in Y, and in Z. And to do that, interval calculus is required in three dimensions. We have four fundamental parameters that we're concerned with in CT scan. Number one is penetration. Number two is resolution. Number three is envelope size. And number four is time. And the last one, time, is where a lot of people get hung up because time is money and money means cost. And a lot of people shy away from CT scanning because it is more expensive than x-ray. That is true. <laughs> Taking all these slices, particularly if you're up above 5,000 slices, it's expensive. It takes a long time. When we do the maximum number of slices on our machine, which is 6,400, that's an eight-hour scan. So what we do is we set the object in the machine, lock it in the chuck, hit go, clock out, go home. And we come in in the morning, and we've got the images, and we post-process them the next morning. 
penetration depends on the material you're working with. In circuit boards, it's fairly easy because most board materials are plastic. However, as we all know, many of the boards we work with these days have mixed materials. We have compliant core, powder, and ground layers. Uh, we're working with all kinds of other metallization, and that can impede the flow of electrons and x-rays. That's not as bad as steel, though. Steel is, is really hard to penetrate. In order to penetrate steel, you need very high x-ray energies. Most of us who have x-ray systems in EMS companies, we're used to working with machines on the low end, probably 90 kV, on the high end, 160 kV, something like that. Uh, for steel, you're starting around 220 kV and going up from there. 450, 600, 900, 180 in some cases. This graph simply plots how transmissive various materials are depending on the x-ray energy that you want to use. Envelope size is another factor that we have to deal with. That's simply a fancy way of saying, can we or can we not capture the object? Sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. On the big machine, whose picture I showed you at the beginning, we can actually CT scan a credit card size printed circuit board in its entirety. That machine can also handle objects as large as one meter by one meter. However, that is not to say we can capture the entire object in one scan. We have to divide it up, and there are a number of techniques for doing that. You can either capture certain segments of the object and then stitch them together as a whole using software later, or if there's a particular area you're interested in, let's say a problematic device is down in one corner of the board, you can do what's called offset scanning, where you will move the object so that that BGA, for example, is in the path of the beam and you ignore the rest. And then you can alter the path and the rotation of the board and capture just that device. So envelope size is important in determining how much of that object of interest you're going to capture. Resolution is usually expressed in microns. <clears throat> there are systems that are standard focus, micro focus, nano focus, and ultra nano focus. And depending on the machine, depending on the energy being used, and depending on the configuration, you can actually capture images as small as 0.1 microns. I think Dage has a system that does that. Um, I have a system that will do 0.5 micron spot size and another system that will do 5 micron spot size. Um, this gives you a couple of scenarios. Depending on the detector you use, we have a 200 micron pitch detector and this shows the voxel size we're going to have a magnification of 1.25x is 160 microns. If you want a uh, magnification of 10x, it's 20 microns. If you use a 100 micron pitch detector, you can reduce that magnification and that spot size. It's all a functioning of the positioning of the object relative to the source and relative to the detector. And this has a big impact on the technique development I was talking about at the beginning. Often we have to play around with this, and what we have to tell the customer is we don't know what's going to create the best exposure and the best image for you. Give us some time. Let us take a couple of different shots. Let us show you what we can do and let us see if we can achieve and capture the defect you're looking to find. And then from that we optimize the process typically to make it suitable for production after that. This gives you some examples of different magnifications using some common objects. 
from the standpoint of the x-ray source and from the standpoint of the flat panel and the detector. Keep in mind again, you have an object that is sitting in between a source on one end and a detector on the other end. And you can vary that distance depending on what you want to achieve. How small of an object you want to look at, how small of a defect you want to capture, how big of a magnification you want to obtain. It's all variable. <clears throat> Types of data needed for CT reconstruction. Projection data. Again, what we're doing is we're turning the object of interest through a full 360. Each projection that we capture of that object is a fraction of 360. So in a simple example, if we take 360 exposures, 360 projections, each projection is one degree. If we do 10,000, it's a fraction of one degree. The more projections you obtain, the higher resolution of the image, the more detail on the image. But that takes more time, and that costs more money. Other parameters worth considering in the setup, source to detector, source to object, pixel size of the detector, horizontal center of rotation, center of beam divergence, vertical center of beam divergence. This is all fancy terminology for setup. Sometimes, quite honestly, we don't know what the outcome is going to be, and so we have to play around with it. And the customer needs to understand it. The simple fact is that scanning takes time. And this slide is an example of that. It's a simple example of a calibration plate where we took four different scans of it from 60 views to 720 views. And hopefully you can see from the left to right as you have more scans, the quality of the image is better. It's the same object in every case. In this case, it gives an example. Say we want to do 1,600 projections for a certain object. Well, when we factor in the machine parameters and what's called integration, integration time per scan, which in this case was two seconds, that 1,600 projections calculates out to two hours and 40 minutes. That's where the cost comes in. In X-ray, you can probably capture the same thing on most x-ray systems in a matter of a few minutes. But will you obtain what you want in those few minutes? That's the question. When we, when we do a job, when anybody does a job, these are the things that we write down that we're looking for. What is the object and what exactly is it you want us to inspect for? And these are all the parameters the customer gives us, or we hope the customer will give us, or at least give us half of them. So we have a starting point, and then we can do some test scans. Why is that important? Because you want to find stuff. And using what we all know with PCBs as an example, some of this stuff is really, really small. <coughs> CT imaging faces lots of challenges with boards. We're usually dealing with micron size features. We're usually, usually dealing with lots of items that can't be captured by conventional x-ray. We're dealing with multiple layers, different thicknesses of copper, multiple materials, high aspect ratio holes, 12 to 1 and greater, very fine line circuitry, uh, and uh, often the defect is embedded deep in the board. But we often can find the problem. For example, I was talking about the credit card size board before. This was a credit card size board. This was a 12 layer board with both through hole vias and stack vias. And in this case, we were able to do a layer by layer scan. We actually did three scans, one in X, one in Y, one in Z. The other scan, we went 
layer by layer, straight down. Then we went from one edge all the way through, east to west. We went north to south the other way. And the results are what you see here. Individual layers. This board had an intermittent open in it. And the source of the intermittent open was that little dot you see right there, which was both a void and a crack. And under any kind of mechanical stress, it was interrupting the transmission on that particular circuit. That was the source of the failure in this case. By the way, this technique is also really cool for reverse engineering. CT scanning is used in reverse engineering a lot. And by that I mean ethical reverse engineering, not stealing somebody's intellectual property. I mean, the, the, the usual case where we would do it, old, old board, old, uh, non-existent documentation, lost somewhere along the way, ongoing product needs support, customer needs to recreate the archive to continue that support. Um, military and aerospace is very common in that regard, where we're still dealing with 70s and 80s technology. And for whatever reason, we need to recreate all the layers. And we can scan all of them and then give all of those layers to a layout person to recreate the layout. The funny thing about this is, is I once had to do a re reverse engineering job for a customer where he, he gave me a failed board, that's all he had. And he said, this has to be done copy exact, the old Intel standard. You know? I said, let me get this straight. You want copy exact on a failed board. So you want me to copy into your board that dead short over there? Oh, well, no, well, uh, um, maybe not. Maybe. It happens. You can also take all of the scans from CT scanning and make a really nice looking volumetric model, such as you see here. This is done by viewing, an anal uh, viewing uh, software. There are several different packages out on the market that do the same thing. They take all the slices, they can color code them for you for emphasis, you can manipulate them. If any of you have ever worked with SolidWorks, the principle's kind of the same. You can put this on a screen, twirl it in any axis, drive through it from all different directions to find what you're looking for. You can even do a full PCBA like that. You can also do other stuff, like 3D printed parts. This is a part for a medical application. Uh, it is a prototype of an implantable prosthetic device. And the reason you see the serrated edges and the roughness there, this is designed to blend in and adhere to human tissue. It's used to hold open certain pass passageways and tissues in the human body. Yeah. And it was all done by additive manufacturing, 3D printing. Another example. Another example. In this case, what we have is a 3D image and then an image in, in X, an image in Y, and an image in Z, cross-sectional images, basically virtual cross-sections. Another medical application. Yet another. That's a hard drive. Completely scanned. This is kind of cool. This is a cordless screwdriver. You can go down to Home Depot and buy a Black & Decker model of this any day of the week. We took that and scanned it, 16 projections, and then created that image, basically cutting halfway through that. That is completely non-destructive. This is a D-sized battery. We do a lot of batteries, by the way. 
We do organic material too. This is a tangerine. Why would you want to do a tangerine? Well, uh, in this instance, a researcher at a university in California doing crop yield research, disease eradication <coughs> research, and DNA analysis wanted some images of citrus fruit in various stages uh, to put in his report to show visual markers of deterioration and hybrid improvement. We didn't know anything about citrus fruit. We do know how to make good images. So we made a deal. We said, hey, we'll give you some images. You can do the interpreting. And we did. And we used, as you can see, we used about 160 kV of energy on that at 45 micron voxel resolution. This is a casting. And all the blue dots that you see looking like disease there, those are porosity measurements, which is very important in, in the world of casting. And software exists that can look for voids and inclusions and gaps and, and porosity on things like casting to ascertain what the strength of the material and the strength of the object is. Very important in reliability studies. This is structural foam that was used in a medical application for drug delivery and for breast tissue regeneration for uh, breast cancer uh, survivors, mastectomy survivors. And what the color coding signifies is the density of the material at various locations. And software can do that for you. This is a connector housing that was used in an outdoor solar array and it failed. And the customer knew there was corrosion, but he didn't know where. So we scanned the connector array, and we found points of impingement right here, right along here, right along here, right along here. Basically, what you see here is what we're viewing top down right there. And trust me when I tell you that's corrosion. And that was the principal reason for the failure of that uh, solar array. This was one of our fun ones. This is a fossil. Guy brought this to us. Uh, retired petroleum engineer. Had a piece of property in Arkansas. His family dug this thing up many years ago, and it had sit on a shelf in his house and been an ongoing argument in his family for 20 or 30 years. Nobody knew really what it was. Was it a legitimate fossil or not? So he calls us up one day. He, he Googled us, called us up and said, uh, can you guys scan this? And we said, sure, bring it on down. And it wasn't even really about the money. We just thought, man, this is really cool. Let's see if we can help this guy. And he and his wife came down. And they brought this thing all wrapped like a trophy. And, and we spent a day just scanning it for them and um, giving them a bunch of good images that they could take to a paleontologist to tell them, hey, was this, was this a legitimate uh, reptile that perished a million years ago, or was this some unfortunate alligator that made a wrong turn in the swamp? Uh, the colors that you see correspond to the thickness of the wall on the outside of the fossil. Uh, it, it's kind of hard to see from this, but it's hollow on the inside. It's actually, it, it was about 18 inches long and tapered, conical in shape. But uh, the different colors correspond to, to the thickness. Red and orange being the thickest, uh, blue and green being the thinnest. Again, if, if you can penetrate it with x-rays, it doesn't matter what the material is. <laughs> that just gives you a few examples of what CT can do. What makes it hard? Well, you've got lots of geometric challenges to overcome. Sometimes the object is unusual in shape. Sometimes it's very large. Sometimes it's very heavy. 
uh, you have to determine what the customer is interested in capturing and then situating it and setting it up in the system to have the best shot at capturing it. Then you have <clears throat> issues of artifacts. What happens is we, we have to separate noise from what the true image is. So sometimes due to changes in intensity, changes in energy being delivered to the object, uh, things appear that appear to be genuine that aren't. Understanding the role of calibration is also really important. With CT, to do it right, you really have to calibrate the machine for every project that you do. And if it's a large project, you often have to calibrate the machine every day before you start a scan. And this is in contrast with some of the other machines that we work with, like testing machines and so forth, where maybe we get it calibrated twice a year, something like that. Here, we're constantly calibrating to known standards. We're doing what are called IQIs, uh, inspection quality indicators, uh, in order to make sure that the image is as precise as we can do it. Appreciating maintenance, same thing. Utilizing advanced visualization and analysis tools. One of the things that held back CT for many years was we didn't have the computing power to process the images. The outputs from these studies usually result in gigabytes worth of data. So we're dealing with high capacity storage all the time. I, I, I've spent thousands of dollars on high capacity drives in the last 18 months. And when we ship images to a customer, it's usually on 32 gig uh, thumb drives or bigger. Often there's video involved too, and we get into the ter terabyte range. Here's another example of a university study. This is a titanium sphere that was, again, done using additive manufacturing. And the study was to determine the porosity of that sphere, which is an indicator of structural strength. All of the colored dots that you see refer to the porosity of that sphere. This is a pin that's used to hold a turbine in place on a marine gas turbine, like the Navy uses for its destroyers. Very harsh environment that it's operating in, very high mechanical stress and strain, and we're measuring the pin holding the blade in place, the pin with a preventive coating alloy over it, and the pin with coating and an oxide layer that's built up on top of it as part of a reliability study. CT can do that. Just a quick slide to reiterate some of the problems, some of the physical problems we have to deal with. Some materials are much easier to penetrate than others. Steel is one of the worst. Carbon, lucite, and teflon are some of the easiest. What happens is you get what's called image attenuation. When you shoot a beam at an object, the entire beam doesn't penetrate the object, it gets scattered depending on the density of the material. And the physicists describe this attenuation in three effects, photoelectric absorption, Compton scattering, and pair production. And that's really fancy and there's a lot of math behind it, but the simple explanation is when a beam hits an object, stuff goes in every direction. And the successful beam, the better the image, the higher the percentage of that beam is able to penetrate the object. This is kind of a, a cartoon schematic of what goes on here. You have a source at one end, you have a detector at the other end, you have an x-ray photon hitting an object, creating energy that's picked up through a window, <coughs> onto a cover plate, in a scintillator that turns that energy into visible light that you can then analyze and then capture with software. And all of this in a highly shielded environment. I've said several times that it takes a long time to do a CT scan, but research is underway right now 
for the next stage of manufacturing and incorporating CT scanning into the next stage of manufacturing. Two weeks ago, I was at an ASNT meeting where a representative from GD Baker Hughes talked about online CT scanning, particularly for aerospace, particularly for inspecting jet engine turbine blades. They have as a goal to develop a system in the next two to five years that will inspect turbine blades in five minutes or less on their production line. Not there yet, but that's their goal. Moving from digital, we're really operating in a lab environment today to automatic inspection equipment. There will come a day when CT is used in an online mode, much as you in the EMS world use AOI now. And that will obviously just decrease the workload and increase the throughput. That's the Industry 4.0 part. I think we all know what that is. You know, monitoring everything, taking data from everything, and using it to identify when our processes deviate from control limits before they become big problems. And making it an integral part of the product life cycle, life cycle from uh, raw material all the way through manufacturing and marketing and operations through graveyard and recycling. In summary, CT is a very useful inspection <coughs> technique for all <coughs> sorts of products, boards in particular. However, there is a learning curve. <coughs> this is not easy stuff. It requires a trained eye, a lot of hands-on experience, knowledge of materials. Material science graduates are ideal CT operators. Those are the types of people our company tries to hire. However, a diverse set of backgrounds is also helpful. Double E's are good, mechanical engineering people are good, bioengineering is good, bright technicians who don't necessarily have it college degree, but who have the aptitude and the interest and the ambition, they're good too. This will be integral in the next evolution of manufacturing technologies in board manufacturing and lots of other industries. There we go. Here's one in real time. This is an FPGA being scanned, and in just a second, we're going to slice right through it. So now we're slicing through from the top down to the individual layers of the device. And now we're going to do the same here, all the way down to the die level and then we're going to do it on end. And anything you see here, you can stop at any point. If you decide, you know, pin A4 is your problematic pin, you can stop right there and look at it from any angle that you want. And then when you do find it, if you do find it, you can take a snapshot of it. Every single image that you see there is capturable either as a still photograph, or most of the software visualization packages out there offer free downloadable viewers, where you can take raw images that are outputted from CT systems and view them yourself and perform your own analysis. You don't have to pay anybody any money for that. It's free. That's what it does. And I thank you for your time. <laughs>